like, dude, you want to show up as a warrior? We love to talk about all these like war stories. And it makes, makes everyone, like every dude gets all gorilla chested when we start talking about war stories. Man, you want to talk about real war? Real war, look, is, that's what it looks like for, for you. For most men, that's what the war is going to look like. And so these war stories sound great. Rambo and Jason Bourne make for great movies. That's not how wars are really fought. Wars are fought with battalions, with regiments, with companies, platoons. Hell, look, a, a staff takes a room. There's four, there's four guys involved in taking a single room. We don't go to war alone. We go to war together. And we start getting this in our mind that the things that we want out of this life, that the version of us that we want to be is on the other side of this pain. Well, then I got to go to war with whatever that is. I got to, I got to go into that cave. So I am here with one of my favorite human beings, Jeremy McWilliams. Jeremy McWilliams is one of the Rise Up Kings head coaches, and he has an amazing just backstory and is committed to serving men at, at, a, at a high level. And so he, he graduated uh, Oral Roberts University, uh, studied theology, and decided he wanted to uh, really serve our country and became a Green Beret and uh, has trained many Green Berets. And so I'm grateful to have him on the show and he's gonna share some of his wisdom. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, glad to have you, man. And he's got a pretty funny sense of humor. So, uh, so brother, well, let's start off. What, uh, so how long, how long have you been uh, a Green Beret? So I went through what we call the Q course or the Special Forces Qualification course back, I started back in 2006 and so Early 2006, I went to what's called selection. And so uh, they take people from all over the regular army. So I was in the 82nd Airborne. So I, I, I joined the army uh, on a delayed entry program while I was in college at Paul Roberts University studying theology. 9-11 happened. It nuked my whole world. And so we were there. Right? I, I got, so I was like literally walking to class on the morning of September 11, 2001. And like in this little coffee shop in the, what they call the graduate center, like the, the building where all the classrooms were, um, I was walking to class and there was a bunch of people watching this television on the wall in this little coffee shop off to the side. Well, I go over and start watching like what's going on, you know, and, uh, in time to see the second plane hit the second tower and it just nuked my whole existence. So I'm 21. I'm from central Mississippi. I grew up hunting and fishing. I... I'm smart, I'm strong, I'm capable, and it just, man, it just nuked me. And so I spent the next few months just trying to reconcile, trying to stay focused on my studies, but then also reconcile this like urge inside of me. Ended up joining the army on the delayed entry program. And so I technically enlisted in the army 18 days after I graduated from college. Wow. wow. Yeah. And I enlisted in the army. And so I, I finished school in the winter and then joined the army. So I was like January 4th is when I like officially started in the army. And then, um, I, but I joined the 82nd initially. So I went to, um, the 82nd airborne as a parachute infantryman. While I was there, I got an opportunity to join the scout platoon or like the sniper element for our infantry battalion. And so my first deployment was, uh, to Iraq in this like sniper element called scouts. And so while we were there, um, just, I was influenced by people that were, that I've respected, that were like mentors to me. And I ended up after that deployment, I ended up going to selection. And so, and I didn't take any leave. I didn't take post-deployment leave. Instead, I went to selection and it was, they call it, uh, it's SFAS, Special Forces Assessment Selection or School for Advanced Suffering. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's yeah. like, it's like 21 days. We went through the process. And then after that, it thins the herd. And now everyone who's selected can go through the Q course. Q course is about two and a half years, two years. And then you pop out the other end as a Green Beret, and now you're the low man on the roster at group. Now you really start. You feel like you just did it. You just made it. You just, you just arrived as this Green Beret. But now, like, everyone that you show up to, everyone there has already been a Green Beret, has already been working. You're now the low man. And what I've noticed is that my life has been a series, like a cyclical series of events where... I get proficient at something, and then next thing you know, I'm now the low man on the roster, but I've leveled up. Does that make sense? Or it's like, it's this progressive steps, stepping process, but each time I matriculate to a new level, 
I'm the low man on the on the roster. Jordan Peterson talks about being willing to be a fool. Oh, right, being willing to be a fool. So to get to the next level, you have to be willing to be a fool, right? To to step into a, an arena where you are not the best. Right. Be willing to leave what you were the best at to step into an arena where you're not the best. Being willing to be a fool and having to relearn yeah. is such a uh, is it is it is uh, an art. It's a, it's a it's a more of a mindset. It's being willing to risk one risk oneself for in the pursuit of becoming the best that we can possibly become. And I and I've seen that in your life. It's been it's been true. I mean, even now you're in. Uh, you're doing some martial arts, right? And you're having to, right? You're, cause you're gonna, strangled a lot. Like he says that, Martin, it makes it sound sexier than it is. I get strangled every week is what happens. <laughs> despite my best efforts to prevent it from happening. Yeah. Right. You're skilled at so many areas, yet you're willing to go step into an arena. And I, and I think part of the reason is you're, uh, you're just a, a family man. And you want your kids to be involved in that, I think, also. Yeah. Totally. Right. So tell us a little bit about your family. Sure. Yeah. So I have um, my wife, Bethany, amazing human being. Uh, my three daughters, Parker, Piper, and Griffin, 12, 10, and seven. And so I just am surrounded by all of this estrogen. Uh, and I love it. And so I came from, I had only, only like really only brothers growing up. And then, um, I got my mother, but yeah, it was like hunting, fishing kind of growing up. And then I, I, I go to college and college, it's like all, all male dormitory. So it's all dudes. And then I go in the army, it's all dudes. And now my life is like, it's like all girls. And so to be honest, like when, when we come out to do the, the events for Rise Up Kings, it's kind of like a cool boys weekend too. And at the same time, you get to kind of hang out with the bros and then I go back home and then it's like, you know, it's, it's uh, his tea parties and snuggle, snuggling, watching movies, which is really who I am. I mean, I just, I love to snuggle. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. <laughs> let's have, let's have a conversation around, uh, and that's what I love the, I love the, uh, the contrast, right, from being a straight warrior, right, willing to go to war, committed to being the best version of yourself uh, in, in every way, physically, mentally, like being that 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 warrior and being the lover, right, at the same time, right, being willing to, to do tea parties and snuggle and mm -hmm. just having that level of care and heart, right, so we can have that contrast, which I think is, uh, is, is part of what makes you so powerful and I think part of what makes kind of what we teach so critical, right? It's not just about being this masculine warrior. It's, hey man, how do you love your wife and treat her well? How do you yeah. love your kids and treat them well? You can show, I mean, that, that's how, I mean, that's actually the manifestation, in my view at least, that's the manifestation of toxic masculinity, yep. is this idea of, like, I need to be warrior, and now warrior becomes the intent. So now I'm focused on warrior. Well, you're going to hit what you're aiming at. And so, like, if I'm focused on being warrior, then things like being father and lover and community support and minister and pastor and like uh, being affectionate and communicative and all these things, these all now go to the peripheral because I'm focused on being warrior. Man, that's like, if we show up conscientious in our life, like paying attention to the way in which we show up in this life of ours, then we can start to recognize, man, I, I am a, why am I a warrior? Because I love, right? Like it's because I love my country my wife, my kids, you know, mm -hmm. stuff starts making me emotional. So yeah, I cried. Get over it. <laughs> you should see him out in the, uh, in his instructor role. I appreciate your vulnerability. I think, yeah. I think part of the conversation, right. And, and stuff that some of my posts have been, um, I had a post go viral and it was around intimacy, mm -hmm. right? It was around intimacy and connection. And there's so many men that struggle uh, being intimate and being vulnerable with their wife and really sharing all of themselves. And so, uh, we've had a lot of conversations recently about that. And, 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 and part of that, right. That I was talking to one of our other instructors, John, he talked about his, uh, his bomb suit, right? The bomb suit is designed to protect you. Uh, and it's also creates this wall where it makes it difficult to walk. It makes it difficult to connect. It makes it difficult to to be intimate, uh, right? Such a great analogy. Yeah, and it's it's these walls that we've learned over the years to throw up, where we have our facade, we have our secrets we don't want to share. Every secret we don't share is a wall that starts to get built up with our wife. And so it prevents this deep level of intimacy and connection. Yeah, but when we show up conscientious, we can deliberately put on the suit, and then we can take off the suit. Yeah. Like when we show up conscientious, like, we don't walk around in the bomb suit to go get groceries at the grocery store, everything, it starts to damage all these other areas in our life when we constantly walk around with it. 
But if we don't show up aware in our life and recognize those areas where we're wearing the suit, then we are not aware to take the suit off when it's time to take it off. And now we have trouble communicating with our wife. Now we have trouble communicating, connecting with our kids or with our community. Everyone misunderstands us. Now I'm the victim because I can't be understood. And it starts this downward, negative downward spiral. Well, man, if we start paying attention to how we show up, if we start paying attention to or asking questions even, why is it that I do what I'm doing? And really be honest, I mean, that in and of itself, like an honest effort in asking honest questions about yourself, man, you might uncover some things that you don't, you weren't ready for. And it's like a willingness to go down that journey. And that's where most of the men at Rise of Kings, which is where we find them, honestly. It's like, I, I, I know there's something more. I want something different, but I'm not sure of exactly how to make that happen. So they'll end up coming here and getting some new perspective, right? And and next thing you know, they're showing up more aware, more deliberate, more on purpose. Um, you're talking about the cave. Yeah. Well, so was that Carl Jung says that the the things that we most want are found where we least want to look. It's it's a Luke Skywalker model, right? Like the cave and day go by. I'm not even a Star Wars fan, really, but it's like that that idea is that we deliberately walk into that place that inside of there has everything we're afraid of. Inside of that place, everything we could... There's things in there that we're afraid of that we weren't even tracking we were afraid of, but the willingness, the bravery to go step into that stuff, um, that is where the growth happens. So like Jordan Peterson also talks about in the story of King Arthur that the knights on the round table set out to go find the Holy Grail and that every man was to enter the forest at at the point in the forest that was darkest to him is that that's where they were going to enter the forest is the point of the forest that was darkest to him. It's completely subjective. Like your journey doesn't start where your journey didn't start where mine started. We have totally different backgrounds. There are some aspects of it that are similar. I'm from central Mississippi. You're from California. Like we had different experiences there, but man, like I can say honestly, and we've gotten to know each other pretty well now. Like, Brother, you went in the cave. I, I've gone in the cave, but that po- I've gone in the forest. You've gone, but we entered the forest at different places, the place that was darkest to us. And all those negative things, we start catching hints of the negative as- attributes in our life. Instead of pretending like they don't exist and putting on blinders, stepping boldly into that. What is it about this that is affecting me negative? Because if I'm intent on showing up in my life as the best version of me, then there is an onus on me to step in and square up, as we talk about here, as to square up to that threat and to go and handle and do the work. Do you want to show up as a warrior? We love to talk about all these like war stories and it makes makes everyone, like every dude gets all gorilla chested when we start talking about war stories. Man, you want to talk about real war? Real war, look, is, that's what it looks like for, for you. For most men, that's what the war is going to look like. And so these war stories sound great. Rambo and Jason Bourne made for great movies. That's not how wars are really fought. Wars are fought with battalions, with regiments, with companies, platoons. Hell, look, a, a staff takes a room. There's four, there's four guys involved in taking a single room. We don't go to war alone. We go to war together. And we start getting this in our mind that the things that we want out of this life, that the version of us that we want to be is on the other side of this pain. Well, then... I got to go to war with whatever that is. I got to, I got to go into that cave, but I don't have to go there alone. Like my own awareness, my own relationship, individual as a singular human being on the earth relationship with Jesus Christ, my brothers to my left and right are here with me as I enter into that forest. Now there's, there's aspects of that I have to do alone, but I'm not at war alone. I may have to fight a battle alone. Dude, I go to war together. Mm. Like, yeah. There's so many men out there that are going to war alone. Yeah. Right? They don't have Christ. And they may have Christ, but there, there's no brothers that are supporting them. Right? And so it's a gap that we tend to see is these men that when they when they run into the pain, when they step into the pain, when they experience pain, when pain comes at them, they, they, don't, they don't have a, a community. They don't have men that are willing to stand there with them with locked arms. And so mm. I think that's what's so powerful. You know, part part of my journey, right? As growing up, I had a lot of insecurities with uh, 
just a, just in general, right? I had, secu- I had a lot of stuff happen in my childhood, which created a lot of insecurities. And so I tend, I, 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 I used to tend to, to to go by myself. I would go take the path and walk the path by myself. And I thought, and, and I would keep people at a distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't until I learned that the power is really when I tag people in and say, hey, can, let's go walk this path together. Hey, you know what? I'm about to go do a, a workout journey or hey, I'm about to go uh, a level up in fatherhood. Do you want to go level up with me? Can we, can we do this? Like one of the first things I do when I go to a new school is I go, I actually go start a Bible study. So when my kids, we move around a lot. So whenever we, the kids join a new school, I grab all the first grade dads and as many as I can find and say, Hey dude, let's go do life together. And then I launch a Bible study and get as real and vulnerable as I can. And the reason I do, I start the first session off. The reason I start the first session off by going as raw and real as I can, is I want that place to, I want that to be a safe place where guys can connect with each other. Yeah, we have guys expectations right now. 100%. For, for really? guys can say, hey, dude, I, I've actually really struggled in my marriage. But if I don't create that environment, right, when a guy's struggling in his marriage or he's struggling with porn or he's thinking about leaving his wife or there's these issues that happen, uh, if there's not that, like, where do you go? Like, when you're struggling with these deep, dark things, where do you go to go, be transparent to be no right yeah you, you come to christ and the power is like in community with other brothers and so i um i confess your sins one to another that you may be healed yes yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another these are things that we hear but the reality is like what is sharpening it, it doesn't say hey pray more and your axe gets sharpened yeah that, that isn't that isn't what i've read in the bible so what, what I've read there is that iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. And the idea of sharpening is that when we run the file over the blade, the, there's material removed. Like, if you think about it, there are filings when you're done. That, those filings were once a part of the blade. And the file runs across the blade, removes part of the blade. And then you turn it over and you file the other side. And the blade gets, like, material is removed. Dude, what is in me that needs to get removed? What is in me that is the metaphorical shavings that should be on the table so that my max can get sharp? Like, what is that in my life? And by the way, you can't do it. Like, it suck. like it's not me. I didn't decide this, but like the Bible clearly tells us it's that, that the way in which the tool is sharpened is through brotherhood. And so who is it in your life that's run? Is that, is that a comfortable process of having the material mm-hmm. removed yeah no it's sandpaper man and sometimes it's brutal it, it's to make something smooth you have to use the grit like to make the wood smooth you have to use the grit and friction <laughs> mm-hmm. but that's kind of a cool it's kind of what we do here yeah grit and friction and so what we do to make the wood smooth is we use motion friction and grit and it removes the material that isn't smooth. What we do to sharpen the axe, we remove the material that isn't in the proper, like, uh, the proper angle so that the blade is sharp. And so then we use the file. We use the hardened file. Well, <laughs> if you don't have hardened files mid in your life that are like hardened files, the, the brother, you're not a sharp tool. And you can still cut down a tree with a dull axe, but it'll work your hands raw. Just like maybe your marriage is being worked raw or the relationships in your life being worked raw because you're not sharp. It, it, it'll just chew your hands up. Because you can cut down a tree with a spoon. It doesn't mean it's the right tool for the job. Right? And so when we get to work with it as a dull tool, we go to work. Dude, we can get the, we'll get work done. We'll, we throw effort at it. We could get it done. But we could get it done in half the time and then we could have the bandwidth to do more work because our hands aren't chewed up. Right? So if, if, my, if my tool is dull, I can do the work, keep throwing effort, but that's not sustainable. Yeah. It's going to start wrecking things. And now my hands are chewed up, but now I've got more work to do because that's life. It keeps coming at you. And so I go to do the other work. Now my hands are starting to get infected because I haven't had, they haven't had time to heal. And, and this analogy just kind of keeps going, but I'll stop there. But then the point is this analogy keeps on matriculating and, and so often we are that dull tool and we just keep throwing effort at it when really what we're missing 
is sharpening us. And you say something great all the time, like men will spend so much money on like getting the higher trim package on their pickup, but they won't spend money on investing in themselves. I, I, it's kind of interesting, right? Like if, if you don't have anyone in your immediate proximity who's sharpening you, like you, if you look up and you can't see anyone in your immediate proximity, well then brother, the onus is on you. You got to go find it. I, I was in that spot. I've, I've been in that spot before where it's like, I look up and I don't, it's not evident to me that there's anyone there. And so you go on the hunt and you go find that. Yeah, there's a lot of men that have become dull, right? Mm -hmm. Become dull and then therefore become weak because they've stopped trying, right? They've, they've, they've sacrificed their dreams. They've decided to settle for an average marriage. They've, they've become dull and they realize that, hey, I'm not, I'm not as effective, so I'm going to stop trying. And so we have a lot of, uh, I think one of the things that's really critical and something that's on my heart is, is uh, sharp, sharpening men and strengthening them, right? So we, we have the refining process and we have the forging process, right? How do you forge a man to strengthen him, right? Because what's needed is strong men because life is hard. Yeah. Life is, is a struggle. It's difficult. Your wife is going to, there's going to be an, there's going to be a health scare. There's going to be times where your, it's your business is going to require more of you, but you still have to stay balanced with your kids. You still have to do everything. Right. So it, it, it requires a whole new level of character and strength. And so we have men that ha give up easily. And so society right now, they want they want to blame the issues uh, on strong, overly masculine men. When in reality, it's the weak men that have caused all the issues, the weak man that's willing to uh, give up in his marriage. It's the weak man that says, you know what, I'm not going to have the hard conversations with my daughters about sex. I'm not going to do these things. It's too difficult. It's the weak man that causes chaos in society. And so there's, I believe there's a call and there's a movement where men are, men are feeling this mm -hmm. and they have this desire to really rise up, to really get to this next level. To, to, they're desiring to be strengthened. Um, and, and there's strategy around strengthening, right? And so part of being a, a, a powerful man, there's a couple pieces of this, right? We talk about being willing to be discomfort, discomfortable, right? And then also articulation. So let's let's talk about that for a, a minute. Sure. So um, one of the things that you'll hear here on repeat is an articulate man is a dangerous man. So like, you can have a great tool. You could have this great ax, unless you know how to swing it and where to use it and where to place it and how to make the cut. The, the, the the knowledge of how to do that is important to utilize the tool correctly and get the end state accomplished. In that same way, our ability to articulate with our words, to put English words or whatever your language is, put, to put actual words to what we feel and how we are and what, like that connection between um, communicating where another person can hear what is going on in me, mm. that makes a man very dangerous. And so when, when a man can articulate what it is that he's feeling, when a man can articulate a concept, a principle, when, when you can articulate these things so that other ears can hear them, now you become effectively a force multiplier. That's what we do here. We take relatively basic principles and concepts, biblically based principles and concepts. We use different mechanisms to teach lessons. Both the mechanism and the verbal words are used to articulate the lesson clearly. The man goes home with a lesson, a deeply seated lesson that he's both felt and heard. He goes home and is able to create impact in everything that's in the wake of his responsibility. Wife, kids, business, community, local church, everything that's in the wake of responsibility of that man. So what we have done is that we've effectively multiplied. We've taken the voice of one man and transformed that into affecting a multitude of people, generations. But that happens through deliberate articulation of principles and concepts. And so uh, it's not enough just to understand what's going on in us or what's going on with the situation. 
there's another side to that coin and it's being able to articulate what it is that's going on in ourselves or in that situation. Mm. You, would you say that's a, that's a, a learned skill? Uh, well, I think that some people are kind of born with a, 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 a more of an ability to do this, uh, but absolutely, just like some people are born more coordinated, doesn't mean that if you're, if you're kind of a, a gangly person, you can't ride a bicycle. You absolutely can ride up. You, you can absolutely learn to be articulate. And so I would I would ask the question then of, of people maybe watching this is that, do you say then things like, oh, I just, I'm not a, I'm not a good communicator. And you're like, God created the heavens and the earth by speaking them into existence. What is it that you're speaking into is existence? Are you speaking into existence, your inability to do something? Or are you speaking into existence what you would like to occur in the future? Or speaking reality over what it is you're doing now to get to your desired instinct instead of dwelling on this idea that, okay, up until now, I haven't been able to produce this result but I'm on a journey in order to be able to produce this result. I mean, even just the slight change in language and look, if people can talk about it. It's like, okay, we're getting into some word salad or where people can minimize this notion. But I, again, it is not me making this up. No. God spoke and created out of speaking. He created the heavens and the earth. And it's so then we have to recognize there is absolute power in our words. And so uh, I would encourage those individuals that have that feeling that as we're talking about this, maybe something is sparking in a man or who it, it is sparking in someone who's, who's listening to this. I feel as though I'm one of those individuals that has difficulty articulating what it is I'm feeling. And maybe that manifests in your marriage. I think that a lot of people that manifests in their marriage, right? I just with the, and the, and, oh, I just forget it. And then you just bowl mm -hmm. and you'll just, you'll just retract. Okay. So let's step in, let's be conscientious. Let's step into what, let's examine that like a scientist. Let's, let's look, why am I doing that? Well, you're doing that likely because you're frustrated that you can't speak out what you feel. Yeah. So through deliberate thought, meditation, journaling, we can start to put English words to feelings that we're feeling. Now it's going to take you a minute at first, but as we start to do that, we start building these neural pathways that allow us to connect that feeling with that word. And now, now it starts to flow faster, but it will never get better unless we make the effort to do it now. Well, it starts with thinking it's even possible, right? So language is the key to possibility. So with language, we open up possibility. It starts. So when somebody, when my son says, my 10 year old says, hey, says, Hey, I can't do that. When you say can't, what that does, it's not, it's not just some, you know, new age thing. Oh, don't say can't. When you say can't, it closes off possibility. Now, if you were to say, hey, I might be able to do that, that opens up possibility. And then if you say, hey, I can do this, right? It, 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 it widens the gap even more. It brings the possible future. And so what happens is so many of us were trapped. So many people and so many people are, are trapped into uh, the past. They dictate their present based on the past, right? So they dictate who they are and what's possible based on the results that they produced in their past. However, where true uh, growth and possibility happens is when you say, hey, what's possible in my future? What's possible in my business, right? What's possible in my marriage? What's possible in my, uh, in my, physical, bo with my physical body? What's possible? And then how do I speak words that keep that possibility open so that I can have a vision to go achieve that? And so with us, like with me, right? I like to play in the realm. I like to play in the realm of possibility. Like what is possible with Rise of Kings? What's possible with my business? Is it possible to really be a two-day CEO, right? Before I shut it down, let's play with the idea that it's even possible. And then, and, and guess where possibility comes from? It comes from associations. It comes from seeing somebody or hearing somebody, right? And so your associations matter more than you realize, right? When you can walk alongside somebody or you see somebody running a business in two days, or you see somebody with an incredible marriage, or you see somebody that's been, you see somebody that has saved themselves for marriage, right? As a young adult, right? When you see somebody that's actually waited the entire time not to have sex, that opens up a possibility to go, oh, wow. So I really could wait, right? But if all of your friends are having sex before marriage, right? Then that's the expectation. 
So the standard, right? What you see creates that possibility. Associations be as well. I'll do whatever I can to be around the highest level associations. Like what I'll pay whatever, or right? I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend time with some qual the highest level P and I'm still on the hunt for the highest level associations I can find because I know that their mindset, their way of thinking opens up possibility for me. Yeah. So I have some closed possibilities. I have closed possibilities. And so when I get around those people, it starts to open up what's possible. And so that's uh, something that has been, uh, I think I found that lesson out early on as a kid when I realized that the associations I were hanging out, uh, spending time with were uh, causing me more harm than success. And I think that there's still a lot of adults that are hanging out with people that are not opening up possibilities that oh, keep sure. that keep them locked in a cage, right? Guys that going out to strip clubs or, hey, let's, let's, let's go drinking, let's go party, let's, or, hey, uh, that's not possible. Even having friends that play a small game. Like I want to be around people that are playing a big freaking game where I can go, I can go get excited. Like I, I want to be around guys that cause me to level up, right? You're the way you articulate, right? Some of the clarity that you have around some things causes me to want to play at a higher level. Like that's where we get to rise together is when we're around guys that are playing at a high level and it pulls us up. We we, we, there's something innate in men where we want to be the best that we can be. It's, it's built, God built that into us. We're, we were designed, I believe, for excellence. And we have so many guys that are operating at average and mediocre. And so, but I believe we were designed like we were created in God's image. We're designed for excellence. And I used to say greatness, and I love that word. Uh, however, it's lost some meaning as it's been abused uh, lately. So I'm not striving for greatness, right? My personal greatness, I'm striving for excellence. Right. I desire, I desire excellence in my life, not me to be the greatest, right? The goat, the greatest of all time. I want God to be the greatest of all time. Right. And if, if getting, if, if me becoming great or excellent causes God to be seen, then I'm willing to go there. But I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to be that. My desire is not for me, my, my own reputation to be the greatest of all time. I'll do it if there's a, a higher purpose behind it. And so anyway, so the, the no, distinction no, between excellence and greatness that I've been um, playing with lately. No, so as you're talking there, one of the things that occurred to me too is, is a concept that we talk about here all the time is this idea of that you'll do more when you do it with others. Yep. Like yep. you'll, you, huh, this absolutely plays. So if, if, when I go to the gym, if I go into like one of those workout classes it, where like, so my, my gym will have these classes every morning or whatever. And so you can go do the, do the class and you're in there and it's like, you know, it's half mix of like guys that are doing a workout before they're going to work. And then like soccer moms who are quickly getting a workout in before they they have to get up and get kids to school or whatever. So it's kind of an eclectic group of people in there. But as soon as that thing starts, it doesn't matter how tired I am. It doesn't matter how much sleep I had the night before. If I can just get myself to the class, I know I can trigger my ego, which has been a negative component in my life. But being around other people, I can use my own ego, this thing that was negative in me, I can use it as a positive and I'll, I'll push and push and push and try and, and like, I see someone's got, they're, they're getting through these rounds faster than me and so I'll just drive and push and push. And then uh, what it does for me is it produces a result for me within my physical fitness. And so like mm. so, so some of us have been like, some of us have, uh, have some negative, we've recognized some negative components in our life. And, and we, when we go out in the world by ourselves and we try to just, we try to be the best we could be by ourselves, there is, you won't be pushed as hard as you would if you were with others. And what that's doing is not giving you an opportunity to turn some of these negative attributes in your personality to positives. And so I've identified this negative thing in me that, that I can now turn for positive, but I can turn it on and I can turn it up. I can put the bomb suit on and I can take the bomb suit off. And, and I can say that very confidently now, um, where I couldn't have before, but, but because in this particular area, I've showed up with some conscientiousness here and I've done some work trying to figure out what is that? Cause there, man, this has showed up in really negative ways in me in the past. Of like just trying to be better than your ego. Oh, yeah, man. Ego, I like I like the the, the term ego, right? Uh, edging God out, right? Oh. So our, our ego. Oh, it's all me. Yep, it's all. And, hey, I'm going to focus on me, and I'm going to push. It's the it's the tool the devil uses to push God out, and 
It's going to be built into us. It's in all of us, right? It's a protection mechanism. Yeah. And we can use it for good. We, we can use it more than it uses us. Right. Right. And so right now, ego owns most people. It's funny. There's a lot of men's programs popping up all over the place. And, uh, and you just see the level of ego they're inside of them, right? So, so many of them, hey, but we're going to, we're going to try to get these guys to quit, to ring the bell. Like we're, it's, it's this whole thing around, it, it, it's an ego fest of like these instructors. And so I, our prayer today before we actually have an event starting in an hour and a half and our prayer right today is Lord, rem- right? Your prayer, Lord, remove the ego from us, remove the ego from our, all of our instructors, from our staff, from our team, from our volunteers so that we can best serve these men. So it's less about us and more about their transformation. We are nurses setting up an operating room for the almighty who's to serve it. Yeah. And so when we start to view ourselves in that role, like I am not here to make the cut. The responsibility is it on me to create transformation in a man. The responsibility is it on me to like, to make the introduction between man and God. The, my responsibility is to show up as best as I can show up and set up this operating room. And so I, we decided on content and curriculum that works best to facilitate this transformation is to come and deliver that content at the best of my abilities, recognizing that in my weakness, he's made strong, but to deliver that content with the, in the most articulate, the most impactful way that I can deliver it from my simple jar of clay and then watch the almighty work, which is what he does, man. Every, every time, time it is, it was still, yeah, that makes me emotional too. Just every time God shows up in such a remarkable way, uh, it, and it, it, to be honest, it doesn't get old. Yeah, it doesn't get old. I can't. I can't yeah. wait. I'm fired up. I know. Yes, yeah, so especially so knowing this, like an up. hour and a half before. I mean, we're leaving soon. Got <laughs> to pick up this yeah. batch of guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're gonna get it. They are. They are. They are. Man, I love the end result. Right. A lot of people focus on change. Like, hey, I want to change. I want to improve yeah. slightly. We focus on transformation, and I want to see a guy's heart completely change. I yeah. want to see his skill set. I want to see everything transformed to where he's a new man by the end of three days. I get, we get comments on Facebook like, hey, can you really change in three days? With God's involvement, you would be surprised at what is possible when he shows up 100%. You can transform in three days. And so it's a, uh, I'm just grateful. I share with people like I'm excited. I'm, I'm just, I'm just honored to be on the journey that God's called me to walk alongside this movement. And as long as he has me involved in it, I'm in. And if any moment he feels like it's not the right fit, then I'm going to follow his, his words. He'll pull me out of it, have somebody else run and lead it. Like I'm, I'm in it. I'm all in as long as he allows me to be in this, in this movement. So I'm uh, grateful to have you brother, grateful for your wisdom and your heart and your care. And, uh, yeah, thanks for being on the show, man. I love it. Yeah. I love you. I appreciate you. And thanks for the opportunity. 